Hi, this is Stuart McGill. I'm joined in this podcast by Lorraine Douglas from the South East London branch and by Richard Mackey from the Manchester branch. We recorded this on the 1st of April 2022, uh, the day when many of us were faced with uh, significant and uh, very, very damaging increases to our gas and electricity bills. Uh, Despite the subject matter, hope you enjoy the podcast and you find it informative. Thank you. Hi, and thank you very much for joining today's Comicast, the podcast series that talks about the issues that matter to you. Today we're talking about uh, basically the cost of living crisis, or what some would say it's now become a cost of living emergency. The current headline inflation rate is 6.2%, but things are going to get one hell of a lot worse. Uh, There's a £693 a year rise in the typical energy bill that will affect 18 million households and 4.5 million customers on prepaid meters are going to face an increase of £708 a year. Now, these prices are going to double the number of households in fuel stress, which is a technical term for those spending 10% or more of their income after housing costs on energy bills. That's going to go up overnight from two and a half to five million in England alone, according to the Resolution Foundation think tank. One building site manager apparently is told the independent he can't afford to socialise anymore. Uh, a hairdresser owner said that he couldn't afford, always afford meals. Sometimes I eat, sometimes I don't. Food bank managers have reported people aren't taking food that they have to cook because they can't afford the fuel to do so. Now, Inflationary progresses, uh, sorry, pressures began uh, since the post-pandemic uh, recovery. There have been pressures mainly due to the effects of pent-up demand on supply chains that became compromised for various reasons during the pandemic. Similar happened at the end with World War II. Uh, we also had technical issues like the increase in the price of advanced computer, chi- computer chips, uh, 92% of which are produced in Taiwan, amazingly enough. And uh, because we ha- we don't have an- enough factories to produce many of those chips, then prices went up, excuse me, particularly in the second-hand car market, because you can't get enough chips to produce regular, new, uh, regular numbers of new cars these days. Uh, now, we talked in the Communist Party pamphlet a couple of months ago, uh, a link to which I'll put in the website that accompanies this podcast. We talked about profit-led inflation, and I think it's very important to emphasize the point. Capitalist economics tells you that cost increases, particularly wage rises, have to be passed on to the consumer as if it was some kind of immutable law of physics. They never actually ask why profit margins have to be maintained and real wages suppressed. Prices only have to go up to maintain the profits that go to capital. It's important to remember this throughout this podcast. And also bear that in mind when you read or hear anything about inflation. Labour share of uh, income across many economies has been falling for decades, particularly since the fight against trade union power led by Thatcher and Reagan and the decoupling of wage increases from productivity growth all of which happened sometime around the late 70s and early 80s. Real wages to labour are no higher than in 2008 when the global financial crisis hit. Now the economy's grown since then, so stagnant real wages means that the share going to capital has grown and the share going to labour of course has fallen. The economy is growing right now and real wages are falling quite precipitously right now, which means again the share going to capital is rising even further. When you take soaring housing costs into account, living standards have been falling for most working age households in the UK since 2002. Now, house prices, which we don't talk often enough about when we talk about inflation, they've risen 20% since the start of the pandemic and are at record highs, both in absolute terms and relative to earnings. This is leaving growing numbers of people trapped in the private rented sector and a significant part of their post-tax income is going to be eaten up by rent alone. About 74% of your post-tax income in London will be eaten up by rent. If you're renting, if you live in uh, your own house, then obviously things are different. Uh, Average rents have increased 8.6% in the past year and now stand at over a thousand a month. This comes on top of a decade where rents already rose far faster than wages. Now, of course, here, 
The renter's losses are the landlord's gains. Attracted by these big returns, buy-to-let investors have swallowed up a substantial chunk of available homes in recent years, making the housing crisis even more difficult to fix. We've done several separate podcasts about this, which I, I welcome you to listen to in this series. Now, the Bank of England Governor, Andrew Bailey, recently warned against the threat of inflation caused by increasing wages. This is straightforward victim blaming. Even the FT, even the Financial Times pulled him up on this. Martin Sanbu uh, asked why he didn't call on powerful businesses to moderate their profits rather than asking less powerful workers to moderate their wage demands. Perhaps because, as Sanbu observes, mainstream economics has a blind spot for the power of capital. And correcting this would mean asking uncomfortable questions about who bears the cost of rising inflation and who benefits. In America, where corporate power is even more tough than in the UK and even more concentrated, the commentators warn that it's not a wage price spiral, but it's a profit price spiral. US corporate margins, pro corporate profit margins are at a 70 year high. They have not been this high since the early 1950s and they've risen 37% in the past year. In one big survey, <coughs> excuse me, more than half of retailers admitted to raising prices by more than their increase in costs, with larger firms most likely to be doing so. Now, the narrative about inflation here offers a nice convenient smokescreen for fattening margins, as some investors brazenly admit. One asset manager actually said, what we really want to find are companies with pricing power. In the inflationary environment, that's the gift that keeps on giving. Now, in the face of this shameless profiteering, calls for slower wage growth are as economically stupid as they are inhumane. Even Morgan Stanley, and Morgan Stanley, unlike us, are not a bunch of lefties. Even Morgan Stanley said at the end of 2021, it's profits that must shrink to absorb the pain of inflation, making up for the decades in which capital has increased its share at the expense of workers and consumers alike. Now, apologies for the longer than usual introduction, but this is a very serious case and we have some very serious matters to talk about there. I hope that went ahead and set the scene for you. Richard Mackey is going to talk first. Richard Mackey is a comrade up in Manchester who takes a great interest in economic affairs. Uh, he's my colleague on the Political Economy Commission. Richard, enough from me. Who is making the money here? Well, who is making the money is the oil companies. So I'm going to start by talking, actually, just briefly about what you were just finishing by talking about there, the inflation. Now, of course, a, a lot of these companies like inflation because, um, you know, it means more money for them. The government like inflation as well. So the government, um, through higher inflation, gets higher tax revenues. Uh, and I was doing a little bit of reading before this podcast. Uh, and um, the, higher in, uh, the current higher inflation rate, the government um, gets about £20 billion a year more in, in tax revenues. So he quite likes that, the Chancellor. Um, then in his spring statement, the Chancellor, he, he, he thought he'd, he'd, he'd put this headline out that he was making some tax cuts. The tax cuts are about £3.6 billion a year. You can see there's a big difference there. Um, and what the Chancellor then uh, did, he said, um, we're going to um, uh, uh, lower the rate of income tax. And that coincides with election year as well. So voters are not blind to these uh, th these things. So in terms of inflation, the government really like it. Oil companies, well, I was again doing some research before this. Gas companies globally make about $220,000 every minute. Shocking. Exxon, uh, uh, a large American company, in 2021, made around 23 billion pounds uh, dollars even sorry and um they use 10 billion of that money in share buybacks now share buybacks are where they literally buy buy back shares from the shareholders and that then doesn't it allows them to keep more of the profits rather than sort of giving out dividends and whatnot so they make a fortune doing that um also as well if they're spending all of that money on share buybacks that means that they're not investing now what the communist party believes is that investment 
particularly in green technologies, is actually really important. But if one of the arguments that Stuart's going to talk about later on, I think, is uh, in terms of investment in um, in green energy, and if the profits go down, then the you know they won't be as much. Um, uh, if profits go down, there won't be as much investment, and and that that share buybacks just prove that that, that that's a lie. I won't talk about that anymore at the moment. Um, just to talk about the UK, um, the big six energy companies. Well, the big six energy companies are making about £1.4 billion every year by overcharging existing customers that haven't switched a tariff. So this idea that they're somehow needing money from these price rises, again, they're making a fortune already. 80% of their profits uh, go directly to shareholders. And again, that to, to, to say that everybody has to pay extra money so shareholders can get their dividends. It, it, that's just not right, is it? I just want to finish uh, by saying, um, again, I read a, a little statistic um, the other day, um, and it said that from the spring, um, uh, spring statement, the poorest 20% of people are going to lose £430 a year, whereas the richest, the wealthiest 20%, are going to gain £480 every year. So it just shows that the levelling up agenda isn't really levelling up at all. Sorry, mate, explain that last statistic to me. How will the poorer people lose and how will the richer people gain? So it was from, I think it was from the IPPR. Um, they, they crunched the numbers uh, and I think it was in terms of things like the cutting fuel duty, which favours uh, wealthier people who have big cars, who have multiple cars per household. Um, the, so, uh, and then often poorer people uh, are, are going to be hit more proportionately by energy price rises because they earn less money. So a larger percentage of their uh, income is going to go on, on, on fuel uh, for, 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 for energy, for the house, for, for, for cars. You've also got things like inflation uh, of food prices. And again, if you've got if you've already got a small amount of money, that's a, it's a bigger percentage. So I think that's where that came from. So let's carry on talking about who's making money. And that certainly includes the UK's big six energy providers. For some historical context, please note here that gas prices have risen by 50 percent in real terms since 1996. And that's before the current wave of price increases. The big six's profit margins have risen from 1% in 2009 to around 4% today. They've raked in over a billion pounds in profit ahead of this year's hike in bills. And they've given away 82% of their profits over the last five years as dividends. So investment in the future is clearly not a priority. Now we can understand that the wholesale price of gas has risen over the last year for various reasons, but does the pain really have to be passed on to customers? Here, we can welcome Lorraine Douglas from the Communist Party South East London branch. Lorraine, thanks for joining the podcast. Why are we going through all this misery to maintain profitability of the energy companies? And do we need to? Well, it's a very good question, isn't it? Uh, and I think we're going through the misery because of political decisions that have been made uh, over decades. And indeed, uh, what we can see today is Margaret Thatcher's chickens coming home to roost at the end of the day. We can trace this all the way back to the privatisation of um, the utilities uh, under Thatcher's regime. Uh, when you talk about the big six energy companies, these are the big six that provide, that sell gas to, to consumers, gas and electricity to consumers. And then on top of that, you've got your providers or your, your, your producers, the ones who actually get the stuff out the ground and then sell it to the providers. Uh, so what you've, what you've actually got here is a manufactured market, uh, not a real market, not one that needs to exist, not one that has an inevitability or a life of its own. It's a market that has been created for the sole purpose of ensuring that capital makes unfettered profits uh, on, you know, on an unbelievable scale and particularly in this country. I mean, if we look at what France has done, uh, France, uh, which uh, uh, has its own um, state energy company, EDF, which many people will have heard of, uh, it's state owned. Uh, they've capped 
the gas increase prices for consumers, not for provider, not, not for producers, but for, for consumers to the 2021 level. And they've capped electricity increases to 4%. Now, how has France managed to do this? Well, they own the bloody company, pardon my French, uh, and therefore they can do so. On top of which, of course, the 54% uh, increase in energy costs that is being um, permitted to British consumers uh, is generating shed loads of profit for EDF, so thereby enabling the subsidising of French consumers' energy uh, by its government. So, you know, the, the, this is not something that's mystical or magical or beyond our control. This is the result of deliberate political decisions to basically make the British people pay for the costs of um, maintaining the profits of the oil producers, the ones who are getting it out the ground at the end of the day and the gas producers. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think that's really um, all we need to say. For me, the solution is straightforward. You renationalise the utilities, you bring it back under control, and then, and then you control the prices. British Gas has said that it, not British Gas, uh, British Pet BP, British Pet Petroleum have said they are making so much money, they don't know what to do with it. They don't know what to do with it. Well, I know what they could do with it. Um, you know, and if the government took different decisions, if it did the win windfall tax, if it renationalised those industries, then we wouldn't be in the position that we're in today. It is absolutely extraordinary that they talk about this as if, again, it's the, the workings out of something which is immutable. These are the iron laws of economics that cannot be broken. You've talked about the French situation. We'll talk about China a little bit later as well. Uh, Quasi Karteng was confronted with the French option here. And uh, astonishingly, well, it shouldn't be astonishingly because the Tories are basically a pressure group for the rich. He expressed deep concerns about the share price of EDF, as if the share price of EDF matters more than energy price increases, which, quite frankly, will kill potentially thousands of people in this country. Uh, you mentioned that people are making money out of this. Richard, over to you. Is a windfall tax on the profits of those companies a good idea? And should that be coupled with some serious price controls? I'm going to say yes and yes. So I think we do need a windfall tax. These profits, uh, the, the profits that these companies are making are out of control. Um, also, if we put a windfall profit onto the companies, uh, sorry, windfall tax onto the companies even on their profits, what will happen is they will just rise, uh, raise their prices. That's what will happen. So the two would need to go absolutely hand in hand. There are other things I think that we can do moving forward. We all know about the £20 uh, universal credit um, reduction. That needs to come back. And actually, I don't think even £20 is really enough anyway. I think it needs to increase further than that. Another interesting uh, fact uh, is that we pay 5% VAT on our energy bills, which is ridiculous because energy is something that we all need why we're we paying value-added tax on energy that's that that doesn't seem right or fair that's just a, a, a way for the government to to raise more revenues and as as i already said before inflation helps them to raise more revenues so that that needs to go um like lorraine was saying we we need to just renationalize the energy uh, industry ever since thatcher um gave it into private hands investment has gone down um, the, the, the conditions for the workers have, 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 have gone down. Um, a lot of the investment comes from abroad, so a, a lot of the money goes back abroad. Um, so, yeah, I would say that we don't, we don't just need a windfall tax. That would be a starter for 10. And I think we, we, we need to go much further than that. Uh, yeah, a number of very good points there. I think it should be remembered as well that the... Uh, these price increases affect not just consumers, they'll affect other companies as well. And a lot of small businesses will have some major problems on the back of these price increases. So uh, I think you're quite right. We do need to go ahead and control the prices. Ultimately, of course, we need to take this back into public ownership, but we'll come on to that again a little bit later, I'm sure. Uh, Lorraine, I'm looking here at what's happened in China. Now, despite the recent lockdown problems they've had in Shanghai and other COVID-related factors, 
China's looking to growth this year of 4%, which is pretty good performance, less than the 5.5% target, but respectable. And um, I think inflation at the moment is something like 0.9% on an annualized basis. So, Lorraine, what's happening in China? Why aren't they going through the same issues we are with the energy price induced inflation? Well, it's a communist government for a start, so um, <laughs> you know, so so their emphasis is going to be on doing the right thing by their people uh, and making sure that the general population can benefit from the industries that they have, rather than actually be exploited by those industries to generate profit for a capitalist class. You know, at the base level, that's it. Um, I mean, I had had a little look at some of the figures yesterday. Um, their computer price Pricing uh, level of in inflation, CPI uh, indicator, is 0.9%, but production costs are currently running at over 9%. Um, nevertheless, that is not being fed through into huge price increases for uh, consumers at this moment in time. And the majority of those costs would appear to be being generated as a result of uh, the increase in energy costs. And of course, China is a net energy importer, um, although uh, it's a massive uh, producer of coal in its, in its own right. Uh, it does uh, import a huge amount of um, energy, again, from Russia uh, and from other areas, So, uh, which I guess is inevitable, uh, given the size of the country um, and the amount of infrastructure required to actually meet those uh, energy needs. Um, at the same time, of course, they're also at the same time as, as using the fossil fuels, which they have to do in order to bring the economy up to the same sort of level that uh, we used to enjoy in this country before they impoverished probably 80 percent of the po population. But um, uh, what they're also working on at a far greater pace, I think, than uh, most of the people in the West is the development of green alternatives and of renewables. So uh, it, it's just it just comes from a completely different uh, place. It's not about profit. It is about provision and it is about meeting the needs of the people rather than meeting the needs of its capitalist class. Uh, I, I can't think of any um, more complicated way of putting it, really. Now, very nicely done. I think it shows the French case and the Chinese case even more so demonstrate this doesn't need to happen. This is not a law of physics coming through here. What we're going through is the result of the decisions which are taken mainly to maintain the profitability of the capitalist class and to make wealthier people even wealthier. You don't get this in regular economics podcasts because they don't have the same way of thinking that we do. Okay, Richard. Over to you, sir. Short term and long term, what do we need to do? As we've already said, in the short term, price controls need to happen immediately. People are literally choosing between food and fuel. Children are sitting at home right now cold or not being able to eat because the heating's on. That's not OK. That's a political choice that needs to change now. In the medium term, we need to rein in the profits of energy companies. We need to make sure we, we, we give a windfall tax. We use that money to invest and we use that money to invest in things like home insulation. We need to retrofit homes that are already there. We need to ensure that homes that are currently being built are insulated. That will reduce the energy bills. That will also have the knock-on effect of uh, you know, mitigating some of the effects of climate change as well. In the longer term, we need to get those energy companies back into public ownership. Without that, this problem is not going to go away. Capitalism, as we've already said, the markets, they cannot fix this problem. By their very nature, they are there to make profit. They are there to exploit and, and to make as much money as possible. It, capitalism cannot fix this problem. The only way that this problem can be fixed is if the people own the energy companies and the, and the energy companies work for the people and they work for the, the workers that, that, that work at the energy companies as well. Finally, Ofgem. Ofgem, we've not really mentioned so much in this podcast. That's the energy regulator. Ofgem are absolutely useless. They're on the side of the energy companies. They're pretty powerless anyway, even if they did choose to do something about it. We need to get rid of Ofgem. 
And we need to replace that with some democratically sort of regulated body where we can um, give the energy companies accountability, both to the workers that work for them and to the consumers that use their energy. Excellent. If I can go ahead and plug another one of my pamphlets on energy, I refer to Ofgem in there. And I think I used the phrase at one point, this is not regulation, this is collaboration. Well, it sounds relatively strong stuff, but unfortunately, it's certainly something that can be substantiated by what's actually happened. Lorraine, the same question to you. What do we need to do in the short term and in the longer term? Well, I mean, I agree particularly with that last point. And a, a regulator, a so-called regulator that, that can agree to, what is it, a 59% increase in um, energy costs is not a regulator. It's, it's a, as you said, a collaborator uh, and, and an enabler of exploitation at the end of the day. Uh, I mean, there are so many things that could be done that, you know, um, we shouldn't be surprised that Rishi Sunak missed his opportunity to actually uh, get a grip because, of course, it wouldn't be in his interest, in his class interests or indeed in his party's interest as he sees it to uh, actually assist the working class. But let's just talk about a couple of things. You know, we've got VAT and various other taxes on fuel at the moment. Those are the types of taxation that directly and materially impact the hardest on the people who've got the least. Uh, because they've got no choice. They can't shop around all this nonsense about shopping around between six, uh, what, what we're now talking about, the big six providers, because most of the rest of them have gone to the wall. Uh, they'll all be charging at the maximum. None of them are going to be charging below that, despite the fact that several of them are actually owned by big providers, big producers of oil and gas. Uh, and I just think it's worth just noting that of the big six, four of them are actually owned either by Germany, France or Spain. Uh, only two of them are actually owned by British registered companies, which are in themselves multinational companies as well. Um, so what we've got is international capital actually screwing the British working class uh, every which way uh, by what's going on at the moment. And it's unacceptable. It cannot be, cannot be. Uh, accepted. In addition to the um, uh, fixes that, that Richard spoke about, I think uh, the other thing we need to see now is the development of a mass campaign, ideally led by the TUC, uh, under the banner of Britain needs a pay rise. The time has come and has long since passed where we get the trade union movement acting in unity uh, the only way at the moment you can legally take industrial action in this country is if it's an industrial dispute. The only way you're going to get an industrial dispute in, uh, affecting all trade unionists is if they're putting in the same claim to each of their employers and then taking the industrial action in order to get it. That has to be the push, because what we have to start doing and thinking about is how we mobilise the working class um, to start taking to the streets, to start protesting in numbers and to start showing uh, their extreme displeasure with what is going on uh, and the complete lack of government in their interests by the government that we've got today. Um, I think we're, we're heading for a poll tax moment. I think this is Boris Johnson's poll tax moment uh, coming up. The TUC has got a big cost of living demo planned for the 18th of June. It's a matter of regret that they didn't have the cost of living demo at the Tory party conference in Blackpool last week. But from my perspective, uh, we need to be looking at building for that uh, and building a real mass turnout for that. Uh, ultimately, we're not going to get to um, any kind of solution until we've got rid of this government. Sadly, the alternative at the moment doesn't have the answers. Starmer has ditched the um, uh, policy commitment that Corbyn had to renationalising the utilities, despite this being an overwhelmingly popular policy amongst the British people. We've woken up. We know we're being conned. We know we are being conned good and proper. What is now needed is some organisation to get people mobilised to uh, start taking this on. We have to become ungovernable in this country until we actually get a government that's capable of governing, because what we've got at the moment is not only operating on the basis of self-interest, it is profoundly incompetent, profoundly incompetent, and it needs gone. Uh, profoundly incompetent, and also uh, we're talking about social murder here. Uh, as Mr. Engel said sometime in the 19th century, this is appalling. 
Um, from my take on this, I agree with everything which has been said, obviously. I think also we need to think about supermarkets and other companies should just be told, you guys take the hit, don't pass on the price increases. Now, Sainsbury's in November, because a bit like Richard, I did some reading beforehand here. Richard, is that a very good example to us both? Thank you very much. Uh, Sainsbury's announced a 23% profit increase uh, in its first half year profits. In June last year, Oxfam showed research that and it indicated that 98% of the net profits of eight publicly listed supermarkets across Europe and America were distributed to shareholders through dividends and share buybacks. These guys can afford to take the hit. They don't need to pass on these price increases. They can absorb the prices, the price rises caused by the supply chain shocks, etc. And by doing this, we can avoid increasing pressure on the growing number of people suffering fuel poverty and have had cuts in universal credit, cuts in real wages, etc. But the economy right now is all about making the wealthy even wealthier. Uh, and through this focus on increased shareholder value and garbage like this, which emerged well over the last 30, 40 years of neoliberalism. I think we also need to take control of the housing market. Uh, build more affordable properties and institute rent control immediately. But again, there's more of that on the housing podcast too. Uh, now, also, knowledge and information is very important too, which is one of the reasons why we did this podcast. I say to you people listening now, get out there and do stuff. Are with the information on this podcast, write to your MP, write to your fuel provider, asking how much of your money they're going to give to their shareholders this year. Join a demonstration and tell your friends that it doesn't have to be this way. Lorraine, Richard, thank you very much indeed. That was a very, very good, interesting conversation, albeit all a little bit depressing, but we can make things better. Thank you very much for listening. This has been Comicast. We are anti-fascist, anti-racist, but very much pro the working class. Thank you very much. Good night.